Join me for a conversation with RPG creator Rob Hainso. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. If you don't know by now, my mission is to help game masters and role players have more fun at the table. I create tabletop resource books that you can find at Amazon.com, DriveThroughRPG.com, and my own website, DiceGeeks.com that will help you run better games today or tonight. So I would greatly appreciate it if you check those out. They will only help you. All right. Now, guys, I have an amazing interview today. Here it is. My guest today was the lead designer on 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons, as well as the co-designer on the 13th Age RPG, Rob Hainso. Rob, welcome to the show. Thank you, Matt. No problem. Good to be here. Good to be actually good to be (laughs) good to be on a a telephone call where we we're oh my god, we can't see each other. All right. (laughs) So I'm I'm looking forward to this. This is I think the one of the first interviews I've done for a while. So, okay. well, so please great. excuse me if I'm giddy. <laughs> no problem. All right. uh, well, just, you know, thank, like I said, thank you so much for coming on. Um, first time guests, I really like to dive in and ask them, you know, how they discovered the hobby of tabletop role playing games. Could you just tell us how you discovered uh, this uh, wonderful hobby? <laughs> in third grade, I was living in Germany. And Boys Life magazine had a little ad for, uh, it said, I think it was Lowry's Hobbies. It had a little picture of a German panzer, and it said it was a catalog about games. It was about five lines. I sent for it. This would have been 1972. So there was no hobby. And I started... I, so I bought Fight in the Skies, which is the game that became Dawn Patrol, World War One airplane game. And I was... Uh, Learn, you know, learning about miniatures, and I read in some, I think it was Military Modeler magazine or something, that there was going to be a game called Dungeons and Dragons coming out. And because I think the Lowry's Hobbies catalog was connected to people in Wisconsin, as soon as Dungeons and Dragons came out, it was in the catalog, and I bought it, um, which would have been 1974. Uh, no, I'm wrong. Maybe, yeah, it was, it was 74 or 70, early 75. I really don't know which, mm-hmm. I think. And uh, so I got the original brown box before anybody I ever knew had ever heard of Dungeons and Dragons or, you know, there was, I didn't realize the game was played with uh, different sided dice because although the rules said it was, mm-hmm. I'd never seen a different sided die. There were no stores in Kansas where we lived at that time that had any such thing. Like there was nothing on lot, you know, you couldn't get one. And so, so I started, started, I'm going to use the word playing in quotes, Dungeons and Dragons when I was in fifth grade. And then in sixth grade, I really, you know, sort of, I don't know, probably figured it out a little more enough to like, I was making dungeons for friends. And uh, the thing is, is that I didn't really understand the rules no. because they were really difficult to parse and I didn't have polyhedral dice, right? So mm-hmm. I, I I made up a combat system using a Napoleonics war game book that my dad had got me. I think it was by a guy named Charles Grant. And uh, so I sort of adopted that system and then gave bonuses for magic swords and things like that. I think I did fireballs like using their cannon rules and stuff, right? I didn't know. I, I, what are you <laughs> to do? And so, yeah, so that's how I got into it. And I, I for a while, I bought pretty much eventually every single role-playing game that was being published because they were all being published by TSR, mm-hmm. like Boot Hill and Metamorphosis Alpha and stuff like that. And at some point, I think after I played Steve Jackson's Melee, which I was really excited about, and it made perfect sense and it worked as a combat system, 
I realized that Dungeons and Dragons must have actually made sense. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back and read it again, at which point it was like, oh my God, you know, the, mm-hmm. this all does, there is a game here. And that was seventh grade um, in 1976. And I still hadn't really met anybody who played, except I I put an ad in a local how there was a game store and I put an ad saying I would be a game master. And these two graduate students studying classics from the university of Oregon showed up (laughs) and my mom's bringing in, you know, lemonade and cookies. And they have to tell me that there is such a thing as polyhedral dice because we were pulling little strips of pieces of paper that I'd written one through 20 (laughs) out of my chitty chitty bang bang cup, you know, so mortification occurred, but I, that was like the first, yeah, so I was into it, but even, even though I didn't really know what I was doing, and apparently a couple of the kids I taught had fond memories of it later on, I'm in touch with one of them, who's a lot of fun, and so, yeah, I mean, so from there, I think I, Melee Wizard got me a little bit more into you know, kind of figuring out games that with interactions that made sense. And uh, mm-hmm. I was playing war games and I really got into RuneQuest uh, pretty quickly. And then Hero and all the other things like that. So so you were right there from the beginning. So that is I, awesome I was, to hear. I yeah. was, but the funny part is I wasn't with anyone else. That <laughs> yeah. is like sort of like the, yeah. Like, so, uh, you know, grownups were actually, you know, talking and exchanging ideas and playing games with each other. Whereas I was like a little a little independent wing of childhood. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's fantastic. And I know um, I played for the first time when I was nine and that would be 1982. And um, I did the same thing with pieces of paper. Although the first time I played, you know, they, my friends who I played with, they had the polyhedral dice, right? So well, I had never seen you, them. They wouldn't let you use your their dice? No. Well, I mean, I went home, right? Oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. They, got it. They, yeah. yeah, they had their dice. So, like, yep. I had to do the same thing. I wrote numbers on pieces of paper and tore them up and put them in, a, <laughs> in, in something. I don't even did remember. You, did exactly. you cheat and make the 19 and 20 more recognizable? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't do that. Um, I, just, I did I, about everything else, though, I think. Yeah. I, um Actually, it's kind of funny because I found uh, some of my characters from when I was nine, uh, my character sheets. Um, when my father passed away, we cleaned out the house and the old house, and I found my character sheets like tucked away in a book in the in a closet somewhere, uh-huh. and I found them. So I, I I scanned them in and put them on my blog. <laughs> okay, and. Uh, yeah, they, <laughs> Did you, you have, have a lot of 18s. <laughs> there's a lot. I was just going to say there's a lot of 18s. There's yeah. a lot of 18s. Um, usually it was, you know, like all 18s and then one 16, because if it was all 18s, to keep it real. People, yeah, people would know you're cheating if, if you had all eight. Well, it's not cheating because somehow I remember that it felt perfectly normal to roll an infinite number of characters. Yeah. And as long as you gave each one of them a name and an identity, it was perfectly all right not to play them. <laughs> the, you know, yeah. it was just yeah. like, yeah. yeah. And sometimes you'd realize, oh, this is a better version of Graylar. I, I, I got to scratch out that earlier Graylar name and give that guy a different name, you know, because yeah. this is Graylar now. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And um, or, you know, who said you can't just roll like. 300 times while you're watching Voltron or whatever, and then just write down the best numbers. Like, I mean, I didn't see that in the rule book. I don't, I don't remember seeing that, you know? So, yeah. but you know, so I got some 18s in there. Yeah. There was a lot of 18s. Um, uh, the worst one I think would be star frontiers. I played star frontiers a ton when I was in fifth and sixth grade. And I went back and read some of the rules like a couple of years ago. Yeah. I, I just did not apparently read that rule book. I, I don't even know what I was doing. Well, no, you did what that, that's cool though. You called it star frontiers and you were actually boldly going where no one had gone before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know what, what I was playing, but, or how my, you know, a couple of my friends who played with me, I don't know what we were doing exactly, but we did not play that game that TSR had published. So I don't, um, know, I don't know. It what would we be, doing. It would be, well, I'm going to be catty. Even as a youngster, you made the correct decision. 
<laughs> Throw out the rule book? Is that what you're saying? That, 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 no, Star Frontiers. Oh, Star okay. Frontiers. Okay. Um, I, 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 not that long ago, was actually in a Star Frontiers campaign that somebody tried to run by the book because they had fond memories of childhood. Uh-huh. And it, it, it did break my brain. So, <laughs> yep. Oh, I see. Okay. So, yeah, well, I have never been in a proper one, so I, I just have no idea. So um, it, it worked fine for me, but I, I don't know, you know, why all my all my characters in Star Frontiers had like the max stats anyway. They had like hundreds and stuff, which is not even possible, but I, I don't even know. But, That's uh, cool. <laughs> I mean, that would have helped in our, yeah, in the game I was in. So probably, yes, most likely. Yeah. yeah. So you know, obviously you had said since you were like the only person. So then were you just the game master like all the time? To the extent that there was a game master. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, yeah. um, I had more luck actually running. There was a, I got from that same catalog. I got a game that was from the Luzaki um, that was, oh my God, it was a King Arthur's. I think it was called Knights of the Round Table or something. A little red book that had a, mm-hmm a very interesting sort of choose your move combat system that was only knights fighting each other, either for sword fighting or axe fighting or jousting. And then I ran a lot of that for my brother and kids because since I could totally understand it and actually could totally run it in a weird way. um, And other people knew what Arthurian stuff was. I didn't Mm -hmm. have to explain as much in a way that kind of worked for kids. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, so yeah, but, Yes, I was the game master. And of course that changed. I mean, I think maybe maybe ninth or tenth grade when I started playing uh I played soccer with the men's league because there was no soccer in my high school. Mm-hmm. And then it turned out that the people I was on a soccer team with were gamers. So oh, I ended up getting invited into their games. And so at that point I wasn't the game master anymore. Cool. No, I, I ended up being uh, the game master most of the time as well when I was a kid, but um, I, I kind of picked up on something you said there because you said as a kind of like as to the extent there was a game master because <laughs> yeah, when because right. when I ran D and D basically I was playing to <laughs> and just making up stuff and I don't know if my uh, uh, I don't know if some of my friends realized it, it was supposed to be any different. And yeah, so. I think actually w- when I was running some you know of course I had characters too because if there was only two of us or three of us playing we needed yeah. more characters so yeah. you know yeah so yeah that that is definitely how it worked yeah um in later life i mean i think that one of the interesting things about being a game master is that for i remember a time as an adult mm-hmm. when i was actually a terrible player um a really <laughs> annoying player like i were there are some people out there in the world who i owe apologies to um <laughs> because like i would quote, play my character the way it should be played, which was a terrible way for the game, you know, and just not cooperating. You know, congratulations. I have created a uh, a character who wants nothing to do with anything that's going on in this game. And I'm, you know, and so uh, it was, yeah, I, I made my, I guess I made my skill check or my, my ethics check and eventually realized how annoying I, I was being. But it is interesting that there are people who will be game masters who really, really should be game masters and should not be players. <laughs> because, you know, I know some like where it's like, wow, as a game master, you're one of the best I've ever played with. And then as a player, I never want to see you again. You know? like, so I think I I've d- did some of that as well. I, I know more for me. I think I. I was the game master, but I was running my own little movie or my own little novel. And if you do, you better not deviate from that. Oh yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, very so, hard. It's, it's kids. Yeah. So I, I did it, that and one. And it's kind of the equivalent of when you're teaching younger siblings and other people how to play games or friends, you need to not be such a jerk that you're always, always winning by unveiling rules they didn't know and things like that. It's like the same style of thing that's difficult. You know, our, our culture may not actually, maybe our culture's better now. You know, <laughs> I would like to think it is, but certainly when, when, when I was growing up, the culture didn't exactly have any model of like playing cooperatively. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, you know, Monopoly, no, is, Monopoly is I shall destroy you. And, yeah. and it was kind of a situation where an awful yeah. lot of games play, were played that way. And yeah. I think early role-playing games for kids maybe had that problem a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, things are different now. Yeah. So I'm no. happy about that. Yeah. No, I, I, I absolutely agree because I think all the other games we had ever played was I need to beat you. <laughs> I need to win. And this idea of sitting around and 
um, you know, the game master and the players kind of working together. Um, it just seemed very alien. It was like, well, I'm the game master. I should win or I'm the player. I should win kind of thing. Well, or, and also in the early days, I mean, I, I honestly had very little to do with advanced Dungeons and dragons, except, um, playing it a few times and mm-hmm. nothing to do with nothing to do with uh, second edition. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons partly was, is that, I mean, the whole, the guy Gax approach in a certain sense was it's perfectly okay. If I kill your character right away. Mm-hmm. There is no story, you know. It's like it's all that's all right because that's just what happens. It's a simulation yeah. of a world where that can happen, yeah. rather than the thing you talked about just now about group storytelling, yeah. um, where the where the players and the GM are creating a story together. And I think that I mean, there's I suspect there's people like John Peterson writing books about uh, this at the moment, uh, like the Elusive Shift, which I haven't read yet. But there's and definitely um, you know nowadays where when when character death is not necessarily something the game master is definitely aiming at, but yeah. if the, if it's going to happen, it should be a really interesting part of the dramatic arc of the story. You know, yeah. something interesting should come out of it, mm-hmm. um, ideally. Uh, mm-hmm. And that wasn't that certainly wasn't the case back no. then, which was part of the reason we felt okay about rolling infinite eight uh, yeah. infinite characters in quest of the elusive eighteen. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I, I think too, I I think I do remember like going someplace to play or doing something one time and there was a new you know somebody i hadn't played with before and they had you know a character (laughs) with like the 18 you know 19 page backstory and i have my character with like basic stats and a name that's so so and and i was like well he may die in like five minutes i have got to make you know i i've got to be ready to make a new character i don't want right. to waste a name and stuff on that yes and this other person's like what do you mean like your character is going to die you know and yeah uh, I, I was i was confounded by that i think the, the first time i experienced it <laughs> so they came from a sheltered environment apparently where <laughs> that and that's yeah that's 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 cool. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I have no idea of the cultural mapping of this type of stuff, like of different, you know, places. Mm-hmm. At one point, it would have been possible to do a mapping as games proliferated. Nah, yeah. not so much. But yeah. I know that there were big differences between how people in LA played early D and D and how people in San Francisco played, you know, and that there had been an idea that well, our characters should be able to be transported between worlds. But people started doing that. Like, here's my fifth level character in your dungeon. And it was like, what is going yeah. on? And yeah. you know. I find that I do find that fascinating. So. Yeah, yeah, uh, and well, that yeah, because brings... we wouldn't do that now. I mean, realistically, yeah. it's like our characters. If you're if you're running a fifth edition campaign, or you're running a thirteenth mm-hmm. age campaign, you're running. So it's like that character is is in a web of non-player characters and events and storylines, yeah. and you're not yeah. about to just drop them into somebody else's game. Yeah, as a rule. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah, and. and... I mean, that's something too. I don't think I had talked about that on the podcast. Um, Yeah, I had a, I had a fighter. I think his name was Torg and (laughs) I just took him like, you took him everywhere. Yeah. If I got another chance to play, I just went and he just went through the dungeon with, I think he ended up being like level nine or something when that ended, you know, I ended playing him or whatever. But if somebody was just running a dungeon, we just, put a character in it you know we just put a character in it we didn't yeah we didn't uh make brand new characters for each you know session we were going to do and yes uh weave them in with their grandmothers and that there was you know that the one of the other player's character is their nephew or whatever you know we didn't do any of that now right uh, it i do it all the time but you know back then it was just like oh i have a fighter character i'll bring it oh oh uh, she has uh you know a wizard bring it yep. you know yep. or whatever yeah that's interesting and i hadn't really talked about that on the podcast before but now um you know, you know we, there was by the way yeah. there was mm-hmm. mention yeah. there's there were when different worlds magazine started out way back it was a magazine that chaosium put out it in its first two or three issues it had really really fun articles answering this question mm-hmm. from people who were in the industry or really noted game masters or ran magazines or companies and stuff like that and, and it was a fascinating. It was really good. So, mm-hmm. and uh, anybody, any you and anybody else listening to stories, you know, who like that kind of story, uh-huh. those first, ep, uh, those first issues of different worlds are worth tracking down. Okay. 
Okay, cool. I'll I'll see if I can find any information yeah, they, on I'm that. Not, and I'm put not it positive. In the show notes. They might they might be available online or yeah. something. You know, yeah. I don't know. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll make a note of that and I'll see if I can track that down. I'll Good. I'll see if I can put it in the show yeah. notes for the Great. episode. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, you know, we you know you were playing here, but then uh, role playing games, you entered the field as a career as well. So um, um, was that just because of your love of war games and role-playing games that you just wanted to, that creating them seemed kind of nor- normal or natural to you? In college, I had a lot of trouble writing. Mm-hmm. Um, I barely ever finished anything on time and I had real mental block. It probably had some, it had a lot, a lot of things were involved, but part of it was that academic writing wasn't really what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I came out of college pretty much wanting to write. And I worked on writing for two hours a day. And at the time, I was more working on comic book things and fiction, things which didn't really work out that well. I'd always been, not always, um, I think maybe when I was a, I don't know, sophomore or junior in high school, I'd I'd found Alarums and Excursions, a fanzine that Lee Gold still puts out that had people like Dave Hargrave and a lot of other folks writing for it who were serious game designers. And I started contributing to it as a fanzine. And then sort of just by chance, I don't know, not really chance, but people who were in that fanzine, like Robin Laws, the Jonathan Tweet, Scott Benny, um, later, uh, Chris Premis, a ton of other people, they all started working in the industry. And I'd become friends with Robin sort of long distance and then visiting him just you know by writing. Mm-hmm. And when Robin had a job that he couldn't, I, I don't know, maybe that he needed help help on as in he had better things to do. <laughs> uh, he, I wrote a, you know, a scenario for a role-playing game for Atlas. And so I started writing games as an outgrowth of having been writing for a gaming fanzine. And, okay. and then what happened, I mean, I can just say this, when you say that I have a career as a role-playing game designer, <laughs> well, maybe I do, maybe I don't. I oh. definitely have a career as a game designer okay. because I do a lot of card games and board games and also and and that's what happened right as right at this point uh wizards of the coast published magic and since nobody else knew how to do collectible trading card games either um when i ended up like helping as a play tester with jonathan tweets on the edge and then helping as a play tester and then as an editor and then as one of the designers for uh, shadow fist by daedalus the hong kong action movie game you know that's sort of how i got into the industry in a weird way. It was it was not really through role playing so much even though I started, was working on role playing right away. It was it was also through trading card games. Okay. And when Daedalus collapsed, I ended up going down to Chaosium and working on Glorantha, Greg Stafford's world. So, and so by that time, having had having sort of done two jobs in gaming and starting to design games of, of my own, I I was yes, I loved it and that's really what I wanted to do. I remember a moment in high school when uh when an older friend, Don Culver, was walking with me, and I think that he had been playing SPI's Air War and was commenting on how ridiculous the rules were. And he looked at me and said, you know what? You could be a game designer when you grow up. (laughs) And I was like, what, really? And he's like, yeah, yeah, these rules are nuts. I think you could do better or something like that. (laughs) And I was like, (laughs) and later on, I remembered that actually he had, that had probably, that could have planted a seed. So I might have been, kind of thinking about it, but never quite believing it at that point. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's your long answer. No, that's fine. <laughs> no, that's fine. Yep. Uh, no, it's, that's fascinating. I'm always interested in hearing how um, people kind of end up where they are and that. Um, uh, so, yeah. So I guess it lives in excursions, having, being around a community of people, you know, that there was no internet. So that was the community of people who, well, um, who wrote games and played them. And it was very sort of a seamless amateurs, yeah. professionals all mixed together. So, yeah, no, that that is fascinating. I think that's uh, I think that's good for some people to know who who are interested in creating some content that it's just uh, maybe sometimes you just need to be in a community of people who are like minded and want to do the same thing. And uh, who knows what will come out of that. If it's a natural outgrowth of what you're doing, it's much easier than if it's uh you know, like me going ahead, when I said I was going to be writing comic books, well, I didn't know anybody who wrote comic books. Yeah. 
and the and when I did meet them later on, I didn't I didn't get along with those guys. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, the couple of them, and the couple is really nice, but it's not my not my community, you know, not my crowd. And so yeah, uh, yeah so it makes a difference that way in terms of what you what you actually commit your time to. Kind of those first steps into RPGs and card games, though that led you eventually to being the lead designer on Dungeons and Dragons Fourth Edition, isn't that right? Yep, it's true. Yeah. Yep. So, how did that kind of come about? I had been working at Wizards. I got hired working on um, Forgotten Realms and D anD D, and I sort of transitioned out of that. I'd gone to be, I'd been doing a soccer card game for years that was at Wizards that was being sold in Europe, and then miniatures games. Um, uh, along with Chris Pramus and Jonathan Tweed and a few other people, we'd done a chain mail and then D anD D miniatures, and so. <laughs> At a certain point, I was I had been running D and D miniatures quite a bit, and I'd also then started designing other games. Like I did Three Dragon Ante, which was the uh, is uh, the card game. You know, the Dungeons and Dragons characters play gambling with their gold, and I had just mm-hmm. done that while on vacation and came back to the office, and then people said well, we should publish this, and I was like, well, that sounds great. But I'd started designing lots of games, mm-hmm. so at the point that they started doing interviews for uh, who was going to be the, basically they had interviews to see who would lead fourth edition. Mm -hmm. And one odd thing is that I had been involved in a weird way with the third edition earlier than a Mm -hmm. lot of people at Wizards because I was part of Jonathan's home playtest group. And so I'd sort of already watched the whole process. And I don't know, I interviewed well. (laughs) <laughs> I, I interviewed. I interviewed well. There, there was there was one moment I remember. Yeah, I interviewed well, and I had a whole bunch of games coming out. And uh, it, you know, I'd been working on D and D via the through the miniatures. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I don't know. I think in a certain sense, most of the other people in the department had never been designing, never designed full games, mm-hmm. which I had done a lot by that time. So that was probably a huge factor. And then what was kind of. Um your thought process, maybe going from third to fourth, what were some of the, I guess, some of the key things that you were thinking about when you started designing? One of the things was that it seemed to me that third edition was a really good simulation and that trying to compete with it and simulate things in a different way was a little bit of a waste of time. So because people who really loved the simulation already had a great game to play for that. And so I was, I was going to, uh, we were, we, and I think uh, it wasn't just me, we were going to aim at something a bit more focused on gameplay, which we did in a sense of like, uh, you know, it did not want to treat um, all monsters and all player characters the same. And it wasn't, it, it, it had a lot more abstraction and a lot, and, and not attempting to use the 3.5 way of, it's a, tw- you know, 3.5 is Three and three point five are, are sort of like a language that can everything can fit together, mm-hmm. and uh, fourth edition was definitely more of a game, okay. which I think was jarring um, to the people who really loved the simulation. And uh, but yeah, that that was definitely part of it. I also wanted, you know, my <laughs> one of my goals was that I had been in multiple campaigns where the only character who ever who really mattered as things got higher level was the wizard and possibly the cleric. And I, uh, I, and I was tired of it. I wanted all the characters to be making interesting decisions, and having uh, about their abilities and powers and what and uh, effect on the game as they went up level. So that was something major that I think you can still see reflected in the design. And uh, now, in a sort of a world sense, third edition had taught people the wizard is the only one that matters. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was sort of a betrayal. Then the fact that we actually did the game differently was uh, was a bit of a you know for the people who thought no 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 I know what Dungeons and Dragons worlds are like that was jarring. So, uh, but to those of us who wanted to have a game where everybody's characters mattered, that's what we wanted. So, yep. Mm. Okay. There's a couple things. Yeah, no, that that's that's interesting. Um, sadly, I only got to play fourth edition twice, I think. Um, but um, I and I hadn't played Dungeons and Dragons for a while before that. Um, 
sadly, I had had to put kind of, um, well, kind of touching on some of the stuff we were saying earlier, it was easier for me to say, play, you know, uh, a Star Wars game because I yep. didn't have to do much explanation of the world right. and right. things like yep. that. So, People knew it. Yeah. 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 Instantly. So yeah, that cut out a lot of work, but, um, when I played fourth, I, I I really enjoyed it, and 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 when I say I played, I got to play, so I wasn't the the you game master. The game master. So, right. so that was um, that was kind of a good thing because I had been the game master, I think, there for about probably like thirteen or fourteen years, and I hadn't played in probably that long. I I had run games, but I hadn't yeah. been a player in in quite a long time. So it was a um, I really enjoyed it and I had, uh, I had fun with it. And, um, but like I said, sadly, I was only able to play twice, but, yeah. um, well, the thing you mentioned about leaning to explain less, mm -hmm. that kind of led to something that happened in 13th age when Jonathan and I, after we both left wizards, wanted to design a game together, mm -hmm. we decided to go ahead and do basically our version of uh, D20 rolling fantasy that we would be do without having the company tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. And in order to sort of make it instantly comprehensible, we organized the game around characters we called icons because we noticed, you know, every single D&D &D world seems to have an Archmage. It could be Elminster, it could be Raceland, it could be Gandalf, it's somebody. And uh, every, you know, every Every character, every every um, world has somebody who's like the king of the undead that we called the Lich King. And then, you know, there's maybe some evil dragons and uh, we called those the three. And so we made and the dwarf king and the elf queen and we made those characters so that when you start playing 13th Age, you can kind of just tell players, well, these mighty icons exist in this world. You have some sort of relationship with them. It's up to you which one you want to have a relationship with. And that gets people into the game much faster. Mm -hmm. You're not telling them specific details about, you know, uh, the proper nouns of uh, a particular war place. You're sort of allowing them to fill in details if you want to and uh yeah which which is a uh, basically it, people can buy in without having to um to read an awful lot or to comprehend it mm -hmm. and i note that you know i love the world glorantha uh mm -hmm. that greg stafford created uh and was used in runequest and, and a bunch of other games um but wow when i when i run glorantha i have to really go ahead and you know give people a really slimmed down version. And there are players who still feel like they should know everything. And well, you know, you're never going to know everything. So <laughs> it's hard to do that. Yeah. yeah. So that's one of the, one of the ways mm -hmm. that things that I took out of that, those experiences of the early years of wanting to explain mm -hmm. things quicker. Yeah. And that's interesting because definitely I wanted to talk about 13th age as well. So that kind of the idea of the icons is, is very interesting. W was there something else that you wanted to do that you were maybe reacting against Dungeons well, and Dragons or something well, like mean, that? I think the truth is my design process took too long. And by the time fourth edition characters, when it was, you know, we were going to, we had to like put the book out. I always wanted to treat every character class differently. And if you look at 13th, you know, if you look mm -hmm. at 13th age, you'll find that the monk is absolutely completely different than the fighter who is completely different than the wizard mm -hmm. who is completely different than the commander and for, you know, the occultist and the chaos mage and the trickster. What? So <laughs> that, that type of interesting character class design that really gets the feel of each individual class is what I regretted uh, not having time to finish in fourth edition. We used, um, you know, there's there's big differences between classes, but their structure is very is much more similar. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people, yeah, uh, I I thirteenth age is me going ahead and doing that the way I wanted to. <laughs> so okay. yes. And then, uh, what else do you think it is that uh, sets thirteenth age apart from other fantasy role playing games? Well, I mean, when you say sets apart from other thirteenth age other games, it's sort of a there's a con there's a con there's a continuum, right? Mm -hmm. um, 13th Age is a, it's taking some of the sensibilities of D20 role playing and some of the sensibilities of indie, indie gaming and putting them together. Okay. Um, we wanted people from the start to be helping design the world. Mm -hmm. So, and we also wanted to build the game to be a toolkit so that other people running D20 games could go ahead and use pieces of it. And here's an example. Like we thought, 
we didn't we didn't want to do skills where you're like, oh, I have, I'm skilled in pickpocketing or I'm skilled in horse riding um, or stealth or something. We wanted you to tell everyone or the game master who you'd been in the past by making up some backgrounds for your character, like professions um, or things you've done. And when I say professions, what I mean is I've got three points and I was the the bodyguard of the evil high lich. And you're like, and then when when the game master asks if you have any backgrounds that could help you with a skill check and you're trying to intimidate somebody, you say, yeah, I mean, as the bodyguard of the evil high lich, I had to intimidate, you know, the kings even to get them out of the way. And the game master says, oh, you could use those three points. So there's a way that all of a sudden, every time you're making a skill check and you're capable of telling part of your character's story about how how who your character is actually helps you do better at this and um and simultaneously by making up those backgrounds you're making up things that you're telling the game master that you want the game to be about like you know i've i i've you i've told these examples before but they're one of them's on my mind where you know somebody said in a, at a convention they said i am the only acrobat who has ever escaped from the diabolus circus of hell and i'm like Oh my God, I did not know there was a circus of hell. <laughs> but, you know, if you were in my home campaign, I guarantee you that everybody would find out about the circus of hell. And that's what you want. You want players involved from the very start um, to help flesh out the world. So the world of 13th Age is half designed. I mean, we've got paragraphs about things, but all the advice is that, you know, when a player character tells you that there's a particular cult or that they are the only halfling knight in the entire world, well, then you take them at their word and that's what the campaign's going to be about. And we, we had more fun with that because we really wanted every character to be unique. And we let people, we said, look, you all, as heroes, you have one unique thing about yourself. You get to make it up. And it's sort of what you would be known as, as a great hero later on, and, uh, but it marks you out as different from everybody else in the world. And what that does is it really makes people feel special, but it also tells the game master what they want the campaign to eventually be about. Mm-hmm. Like, they, you know, they are, uh, they're telling you, if I have a character in my game right now who, whose one unique thing is that he's cursed by his ex-wife a powerful magician (laughs) inanimate objects speak to him not that he wants them to but they do and they say all kinds of things now the funny part is this is of course a huge gift to the game master because first of all we established well now you have a a potentially vengeful or potentially loving (laughs) ex-wife who is connected (laughs) with the elf queen and I get to have inanimate objects talk to you, either tauntingly, mockingly, or to deliver information that's necessary to keep you alive. <laughs> you know, uh, it could be icon relationships, could be other things. So, you know, it's sort of that that's an example of a player choosing a one unique thing. The game master is just like, thank you so much. Yeah. You know, I've had uh, the only human child of a zombie mother. <laughs> had uh you know and, and you know which jonathan was running the game at that time and of course that character becomes a thing of prophecy right it's like oh, yeah. the player is handing you the keys you, you're they want to be driven so yeah, yeah. so yeah. that that that's been really fun and that was an example of something that you know really in the hmm, how to say it you couldn't do it at wizards mm-hmm. it it feels wrong for an organized play environment it it sort of is the kind of craziness that that just isn't that welcome mm-hmm. necessarily. But I mean, I could imagine people just using it in any role playing game, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but I'm not positive that in those exact terms, other role playing games have used it. <laughs> but you know, but you could. So yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think that's interesting that you bring that up because. Um, and as we were talking earlier, I think, you know, years ago, decades ago, I guess when I was first starting out, yeah, the game master told you everything uh, down to, you know, it, like the game master says you're in a forest and I say, oh, is there a big tree next to me? And they're just like, no, there isn't. No. That's you a, know? That's, that's, and I'm like, wait, wait, that's right. Wait, can I have a, we're in a forest, right? Can I have a big tree here? And they're just like, no, there's not a big it's, tree there. It's like <laughs> if you filmed that now. Right. Yeah. The the gamers of today would be looking at that thinking they're making fun 
Yes. Uh, like that's not, but it's like, no, that's a documentary. That's, yeah. and, it's rep- and it's not repeated <laughs> once. That's the yeah. thing. We somehow, okay, I don't want to, let's, let's stop talking about all the old days, but it is interesting <laughs> yeah. that we actually tolerated that on yeah. a repeated basis. Like mm-hmm. that that tree, the, the absence of that tree <laughs> it hit you again and again and again. Well, that's, <laughs> yeah. So we're really trying to avoid the opposite. You know, and it, you know, so skill checks, for example, in 13th age, you fail f- like you're supposed to fail forward Mm -hmm. it's like if it's a skill check you need to advance the game and like you're trying to climb that wall you really need to get up that wall it's not that interesting if you fall down the wall yeah so if you fail the skill check what happens well something interesting happens like you're you're supposed to go ahead and like say well maybe somebody noticed you climbing the wall like you did it but you weren't really as you know as quick as you should have been and that's going to have an interesting complication then soon yeah and that's that's the kind of thing we're doing with 13th age where is that a simulation? Oh, emphatically not. Mm -hmm. It's an evocation of the world. It's a storytelling Mm -hmm. group storytelling. And the point is be interesting and have fun rather than uh, lament the absence of a tree, which I think would be a great name for this, uh, this, uh, the absence of a tree. <laughs> the absence of a tree. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, you know, because I was just thinking about it because I think and and I didn't know any different. I think that today's gamers are it's awesome having YouTube and Twitch so you can see so many different game masters, so many yeah. different dungeon masters run games in different ways and different styles because I didn't I didn't know what I was doing, right? I don't yeah. I had only had you know, one example for a handful of sessions when I started trying to run games and, um, and, you know, just kind of thinking of that, I think I'd stumbled on to allowing my players to create one time when I was in the middle of a session and I was tired Oh yeah, and, and they're just like, you know, I'm getting like, you know, 12 questions or whatever, every five minutes. And I was just like, you know, (laughs) uh, you tell me what's on the aisle. Like, I don't even like, I just don't even care anymore. And then it it just realized, I just started to realize, oh, this is actually fun. And my players Uh are creative people and we can talk about this and kind of build something together. So, um, but I I think that is uh, really interesting to say, you know, to to see kind of the newer games like 13th Age that are actually designed uh, for that. Yeah. 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 I mean, and it's not, it's no longer new, so it should yes. be the way it is. Well, I mean, the funny thing is, I wonder, I'm just thinking really quickly, actually, that's an interesting, fascinating question. I don't know the old school rules well enough. The interesting question is whether, uh, you tell me, are, mm. in, in stuff that's in the OSR, is it deliberately maintaining the entire uh, GM uh, GM fiat, or is it also use, using the framework of the old school rules to sort of say, hey, of course, we're all doing this together? Yeah, you know, um, I struggle with the OSR because uh-huh. um, I hadn't I hadn't really heard about it until you know say you know five six years ago or so, and um, kind of looking into it, I get at first my first thought was, oh okay, so we're going back to the you know the 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 game master who is like here's the world you're in here's the things yeah and 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 set it out, but then um, I what I see more about it is that. <laughs> But then I get confused because they do some of these other things too that yeah, you've been saying that are I, newer. I, yeah. And so I, I, I get, I'm kind of confused by that. Um, I, I don't, I think it's sort of like what I'm thinking is that if you're playing role playing games, you want them to be fun. Mm-hmm. And it isn't any fun to go back to the day where the game master is, says the absence of a tree. Yeah. And so even if, even if, the, the rules are going to be old. They're not going to be played with the same cultural understanding. That's yes. my thought. Yeah. Now, I could be wrong about that. Mm-hmm. I'm a little bit far from. So I guess I was asking, and it sounds like yeah. you're sort of saying what I what I thought, which is that it's a little different. Yeah. And like I said, I kind of struggle with it because I also do see um, – they talk a lot about like a lot of the guys who are in the OSR talk about, uh, I should say old school Renaissance or yeah. old yep. school revival for anybody who yep. doesn't know um, yep. who's listening, but um, they do talk about like the characters, like, are, you know, that the players are supposed to use their imaginations and stuff, you know, more to have their characters do things instead of, I guess, just like the character sheet, you uh-huh. know, kind of being, you know, like 
oh, I would, I would climb this, th- you know, this vine. But I over would here climb this, but it. I don't have a climbing. Sh- but I don't have a climbing skill, so I can't do that. So they right. say they want to go back to when you basically didn't like have like any skills or very uh, few and you're just like yeah just i'm going to things. climb the thing and jump off the roof even though i don't have skills for that got it okay yeah, hmm. yeah or at well, least that's I my understanding really, i should probably like th- before i bring it up in another interview i should probably do a little more research <laughs> <laughs> and i should probably do some all right research too, we could do, yeah we, we could just cut this whole thing if we made no sense <laughs> that's no, right i'm i'm leaving it in because all right it, i'm having fun okay but you know we have been talking for a while now i wanted to ask you like what are you currently working on what are some of your your current projects that you want everybody to check out let me think of that's a funny question because a lot of what i'm doing isn't announced oh so, okay let me think. WrestleNomicon just came out, which is a two-player card game from Arc Dream. Um, Cthulhu versus Haster, professional wrestling, the Elder Gods, sort of destroying <laughs> the universe as a side effect. And I had a lot of fun designing that game. Uh, the card art was already done. The names were done for the cards. And so I got to design a cosmic wrestling game, which was a, a heck of a lot of fun. Um, uh, I'm going to be doing a deck-building kung fu card game um, later this year. Mm -hmm. Um, that I'm really close to the design. And if I had a really good title, I might tell you right this moment, but I don't have a great (laughs) title for it. I'm working on that this week. Uh, And that's going to be probably on Kickstarter. And I've been having a blast playing it. um, Mm -hmm. And it's really been fun. It's sort of taking the epic Spell Wars uh, model of uh, combat action and turning it into a deck builder for Kung Fu. Um, And uh, yeah, so I've, I've been having a blast with that. And there's actually one, two other card games that are sadly unannounced, even though I've been playing them like crazy on Tabletop Simulator and I'm finishing the rules for one of them today. So let me see. Oh, 13th Age, Mm -hmm. um, which you can find on the Pelgrim website. Pelgrimpress.com has got a lot of 13th Age resources and sells the books and things Mm -hmm. uh, if you can't find them in game stores. And uh, I've been really happy to basically trained a developer, J.M. DeFogey, and um, he and his wife, Trisha DeFogey, are developer editor team, and I'm working with them and uh, putting out more 13th Age books than we were before. And uh, J.M. is like putting one together called Dragon Hall that I'm about to do a little bit on. Um, mm-hmm. And I've got a couple 13th Age books, but you know what? They're far enough away that even though I'm working on them, I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about them. <laughs> like you can, yeah, I, I, I'm at robhanso.blogspot.com or and oftentimes on the pelgrimpress.com website. And th- that's where there's people who uh, don't follow 13th Age now. Well, you could look. And if you do follow 13th Age, you know everything I just told you. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hopefully we're we're in you know teaching and instructing and enlightening people to new games because uh, that's yeah. what uh, I want to do as well. So you know you mentioned a lot of links and a lot of games there. Um, I will in the show notes for this episode. I will place a link to your blog and to your Twitter and to Thirteenth okay. Age and some other of uh, your games that I can find in there Good. at the show notes. So if if anybody who's listening to this can just head to Dice Geeks dot com and find the show notes for this episode you'll find the links so you can check out some of uh rob's work well rob you know it's a blast talking to you i could talk to you more about like the old days and about uh the 13th age and all kinds of stuff but um you well know, go I ahead have... and pretend right now for a second hold on pretend okay. we're talking five we're talking 10 years from now okay and we're talking about then what question are you going to ask in in five years <laughs> Or 10. Or 10. Oh, what am I going to ask you? Um, what am I going to ask you? <laughs> I don't know. You caught me there. That's a, I that's know a I did. That's terrible. It's um, terrible. I was going to say, like, um, uh, you know, just like, how did you predict that the elder gods were going to pro wrestle <laughs> us into, uh, you know, an, um, an apocalypse of some sort? Yeah, I would say blame Dennis Detwiller and Shane Ivey. <laughs> Those guys are in Canada, and it got spared of, from the apocalypse. <laughs> oh, Canada! For some crazy reason. Yeah, it got spared. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I don't have a good one, but I, I okay. I, you know what? I don't either. That's the thing. It's like I, I, I was thinking we're talking about the old days, and I yeah. love talking about the old days. Oh, oh, but yeah, I'm maybe. actually terrible about predicting what happens in the future. Yeah. So. Maybe we'll talk about um, how it was crazy that we let our players make up the whole world. Maybe we'll have like a reaction <laughs> to that, and um, and uh, and the, the game master will be back. But I doubt. I that. got something. Um, what 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 what? what a, you see, because people always think that the digital revolution is going to completely change yeah. how things. So, what if there's a what if there's a virtual gaming platform that is so good hmm. that people share an awful lot of content and uh dang they're already doing that aren't they <laughs> yeah exactly yeah i we, cannot keep up yeah, yeah oh so. i didn't see any of that coming i didn't see the streaming coming i talk about that all the time on the podcast i i did not see streaming coming i did not see any of that coming but um um yeah so in five years maybe we'll say like um you know, either we'll have a reaction to it and say, oh, well, we got to sit around the table and play instead of, um, you know, well, uh, actually, people who thought I, they could play let me you know, a- on the computer. Let me ask like you a that. quick let me ask you a quick question that, sure. that um, I was I, I, I gave a lecture for a friend who was teaching a college class recently. And somebody asked me a question um, at the end. And um and the question was one that I really didn't have an answer for. They asked me, how am I with my role-playing game design accounting for streaming and helping and doing things, well, changing things to work better? Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, pretty sure right now the answer is I'm not doing that at all. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, uh, that's that's my answer at the moment. So the – and I, I'm sort of like, do you do you know of anybody who is – kind of really changing the way they do game design in order to help streaming the the only one that i've heard of and i i i I interviewed one of the designers on the podcast but i didn't get to talk about that game um and i haven't got to look into it too much but james introcaso and a team of designers did a game called burn bright i believe that is Okay. only hosted on roll 20 huh. so i would assume like i said i sadly sure. i haven't got to look into it but i would yeah. assume that they took into account that this game is just made to be played ah, online yeah. all right good well there's an answer to, yeah. to, of, of some top possibility it's like it's one of those times where a research scientist gets an answer it may not be actually be an answer but it could yeah. be <laughs> no and that's a great question right. because i think yeah in in five or ten years yeah, the, you know, I've been joking around a little bit, but in five or 10 years, the answer may be like, um, why would you ever sit around the table and play when we can have all of these amazing tools or um, something along the lines of uh, your game is awesome. I'm going to stream it online for my friends. And so my audience can watch it. How, how can you help me do that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, as a game mm-hmm. designer. And I think those, those actually may be some of the questions um, I assume this, uh, the person who asked you the question was probably younger than I am because I am still trying to catch up with streaming. <laughs> uh, we're not going to catch up. Yeah. We're probably no, just going to jump in the middle of the stream. Yeah. No, yeah, <laughs> be, exactly. be tumbled. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm way behind, but uh, that's it, right. I mean, I think it's, I think it's all awesome because it's just uh, catapulting the uh, popularity of role-playing games and tabletop role-playing games into yep. places that I never thought it would go. Um, yep. Especially, you know, when I was in days, you know, walking around, you know, high school with my, you know, my role-playing game books, like forlornly going, I wish somebody would play a role-playing game, <laughs> you know, um, to, to oppose to now when, um, it's cool to play and there's tons of people doing it. So, um, yeah. So yeah. Well, I'm, may, I'm may kinda... the bright, may the bright wind carry, uh, <laughs> carry you forward. <laughs> and from what I'm understanding, you have four very, very young children mm-hmm. and, um, I'm sure you're going to be running something for them pretty soon. Oh yeah. 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 Actually yeah. I already ran uh, amazing tales. I went ahead and bought amazing tales, which is a RPG geared for like five and under. 
uh-huh. uh, kids. And we, I, I ran that for them one time and they lost their minds. They loved it. So um, <laughs> I think we have some little role players. Here okay. <laughs> all right. I kind of wondered if you had done that. So, all right. Yeah. All right. Well, Rob, I mean, like I said, I could keep going on and talking to you, but I've had you on here. A long we must time. stop. Yes, Let's we talk. Must. <laughs> yeah. talk another day. All right. All right. Well, Rob, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. All right. There you have it, guys. Man, I really hope you enjoyed this interview with Rob today. It was a pleasure getting to speak with him. As I mentioned in the episode, I have provided links to his website and to some of his amazing TTRPG creations, including the 13th Age, which you should definitely check out. Those links can be found in the show notes for this episode at DiceGeeks.com. So go there and all of your dreams will come true. All right. If you want some free stuff, head over to DiceGeeks.com slash free. You'll get 10 free dungeon maps. You'll never miss an episode of this show. And each and every Friday, you will get an email update from me letting you know what I am up to at Dice Geeks. All right, now, guys, hey, if you enjoy this podcast, I would greatly appreciate it if you would consider supporting it in some way. You can like, subscribe, rate, review wherever you are listening to this podcast right now, unless you're listening on DiceGeeks.com, then you can't do that. But if you're listening in any podcast player or app, you can do that. I would greatly appreciate if you would take just a couple of seconds and uh, do one of those things. Also, if you want to support the show financially, uh, you can do that at patreon.com slash dice geeks. There are some different levels, some different goals there. You can check those out. Greatly appreciated as always. Now, guys, it has been a pleasure being in your earbuds today, and I thank you so much for listening. Until next Wednesday, keep gaming.